Hey, all you cool cats and kittens, it's your favorite history teacher back at you again with another historical video. Today, we are continuing our World War I push, our World War I cram. And, you know, today's information is more or less what you learned for the most part in today's lecture, for the most part, learned as sophomores last year. And so, it should come to no surprise for about two thirds of the information in this video is what you kind of learned about uh, the the skeleton of the happenings from World War One. So uh, let's uh, grab some popcorn, sit back, relax, and uh, get ready to take some notes. Okay. All right. Here we go. Chapter six, lesson three. A bloody conflict. Blood. Uh, that's your warm up. Six dash three. Objectives. All right. So we'll be able to explain how the changes in technology affected the course of the war and analyze President Wilson's plan, peace plan following World War One and the reasons why, why it was rejected by Congress. Spoiler alert. All right, so the U.S. gets involved. By spring 1917, World War I had devastated Europe. These old-fashioned strategies and new technologies resulted in terrible destruction. And many thought with the appearance of the United States troops that it would bring this great war, because that's what it used to be called, the Great War. The war to end all wars would come to an end. All right, so in the trenches, trench warfare is a new thing. American soldiers who went to Europe knew that they would face a war different from any from before. So trench warfare and the technological innovations changed the way the battlefield looked like. And the early offensives in 1914 demonstrated this change. Troops began to dig themselves in and relied on modern rifles and rapid machine guns to hold off attacking forces. They would dig themselves in trenches, all right, about six seven eight feet deep uh and along the w western front this trench network stretched from the english channel e english channel to the swiss border and the land in between opposing sides trenches was called no man's land and lots of soldiers will die there because you don't want to get caught in no man's land yeah probably gonna die so here's what the trench would look like. Again, dig themselves to protect themselves, dig themselves deep in the ground to protect themselves from getting shot at, at above the trench level, all right? So the front lines are about this part. And, you know, you got a dugout for the company all the way in the back. So a very vast and complex network almost like no it's not like that all right so this is kind of what it looks like all right so maybe not six or seven feet deep maybe four or five feet deep so you can still look overhead um and as you learned from last year these aren't the most sanitary of of holes of pathways of walkways of mazes if you want to call them that of land and you got some more, and here's the enemy ready to shoot you with a rapid machine gun. Might not be as accurate, but boy, did it do some damage. All right, modern warfare. In order to weaken both sides, uh, in order to weaken each side, both sides began with massive artillery barrages, followed by scurrying, bayonet-wielding soldiers scrambling out of the trenches to run across no man's land to hurl grenades in opposing trenches. The results proved disastrous. Artillery rarely destroyed enemy defenses, leaving enemies with enough firepower to mow down troops with the machine guns. They aren't that accurate. They did a little bit of damage, but there are more damages in shrapnel, the debris caused from artillery uh, explosives going off. There are more injuries and wounds and possible deaths, possible prob probable deaths from shrapnel um, flying off in the debris. Staggering, it'll prove to be staggering losses. Or artillery rarely, I already said that. 
Um, and these massive rapid machine guns would just um, have soldiers just fall down instantly. Um, so it's going to be staggering losses on both sides. We'll usually lose several hundred thousands of men and horrible scenes of death and destruction. If only there were color photos. Yeah, imagine the those photos that you see black and white nowadays. Kind of be gross. All right, so here's a, a picture of you know artillery. Those are World War One planes, and you know getting up for a charge out of the trenches. All right, <clears throat> new technology test question. After witnessing the slow success of trench warfare brought, both sides started to develop new technology to break through the lines. April 1915, Germans will use, first use poison gas. These fumes will cause vomiting, blindness, and suffocation. Soon after, allies started using poison gas. Then, the addition of gas masks, because you need to breathe in order to uh, survive the gas uh, attack. And in 1916, the British started using the first tank in battles. They helped a bit. Uh, they got through the barbed wire obstacles, but they weren't consistent. They broke down often, and they didn't revolutionize how they were used, how potentially they could change, revolutionize modern warfare. So here you got American soldiers in the presence of gas. Um, yeah, look at those. And here's a tank. Here's a tank of victory. This one's probably broken down. I don't know. It's big and bulky. All right, from above. Oh, that didn't show up. Hold on. Where'd this go? Hold on. This didn't change. I'm making changes as I'm doing this. This never happens. Well, it went one, one too big. All right. Sorry. Sorry. This never happens. Never happens. Brief intermission. So from above, another another part of the test question. All right. Because, you know, new technology, poison gas, tanks and airplanes. So from above, World War One also marked the first use of aircraft in war. Early in the war, Germans used giant ridge and balloons called Zeppelins to drop bombs on the British warships ships in the North Sea. Think of blimps. Those are Zeppelins. At first, airplanes were used to, uh, to spy on enemy troops and ships. Then the Allies equipped them with machine guns and rockets to attack the German Zeppelin fleet. Other small aircraft carried small bombs to drop behind enemy lines. As technology advanced, airplanes shot down other airplanes in battles known as dogfights. But early military aircraft was difficult to fly and easy to destroy. And combat pilots had an average lifespan, life expectancy, flying their new planes for about two weeks because it was very simple for them to get shot down. Not like today. Think of this as a, this is a Zeppelin. Look at that thing. It's big. Easy target. Here's a World War I modern aircraft. Those are airplanes. Here's a dogfight. All right, doughboys. So nearly 2 million American troops will march into the Western Front. They were called doughboys. Americans were, American soldiers were nicknamed doughboys for their bulky equipment. They were inexperienced, but they were fresh and eager to fight. And as this being a U.S. history class, you're going to get a lot of America. So as Americans began to arrive, many in Germany concluded that the war was lost. So uh, Google Doughboys, this is what showed up. All right, dub ships. Um, American Admiral William S. Sims proposed that merchant ships and troop transports travel in groups called convoys. So small maneuverable warships called destroyers protected American convoys across the Atlantic. If a ship was sunk, other ships in the convoy could rescue the survivors. Convoys greatly reduced shipping losses and ensured American troops arrived safely in time to help the Allies on the Western Front. Here's a picture of convoys. So you have your, you know, your black 
is your armed trawler, your merchant ships sending goods across the Atlantic. All right, you have a cruiser or a destroyer. You have a fast ship with a lookout balloon. And you have these uh, destroyers zigzagging in and out, in and out. And they're looking for, um, you know, U-boats out, out in the ocean lurking. And they'd have decoys. So if this straggler of a boat was shot down, they would know enemy is near. All right. A little brief skirt skirt. Because while we're, in, while we're in Europe, we might as well talk about Russia. March 1917. Riots broke out in Russia, and March 15th, uh, officially Tsar Nicholas II abdicated the throne, stepped down, and put a provisional government in charge. The government wanted to keep fighting the war and supporting the troops in the war, and that is going to be one of their downfalls. Um, so with that in mind, there's a communist revolution happening. The Bolsheviks in power, or nicknamed commies, communists, will soon take power under Vladimir Lenin. Germany's fortunes improved by Russia's withdrawal. Lenin says, hey, we are going to have a full-on country revolution, so we need to get out of the war and focus on us before we focus on the world. So Lenin pulls Russia out of the war. That helps, benefits Germany. Lenin signs the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, March 3rd, 1918. So almost the whole year after the revolution. All right. So the communist revolution is kind of like a little two-part, you know, I think it's like the February revolution and the October revolution, something like that. Uh, so it is what it is. Um, Russia will have to give up lots of land but it got rid of the Germans on the Eastern front. So, you know, we're like uh, ice cube Bye, Felicia. And that's Vladimir Lenin. All right. It pays a debt. So at the time world war one began, many Americans believed that they owed a French a debt for their help in the American revolution. General John J. Pershing commander of the American expeditionary force AEF arrived in Paris, July 4th, 1917. British and French commanders wanted to integrate American troops into their armies. Pershing refused, and eventually only one unit, the 93rd Infantry Unit, an all-African American unit, would be transferred to the French. That's General John J. Pershing. He probably looks like a guy you don't mess with. All right, so Americans get experience, and a double XP weekend it is. After the Eastern Front closed, Germany focused all its resources on the Western Front. March 21st, 1918, they will launch a massive attack and push the Allies deep behind their lines. By early June, the uh, Germans were 40 miles from Paris. Pretty close. Americans, however, played an important role in pushing back the Germans. As Germany pushed in late May, the U.S. will launch its first major attack, capturing the village of Cantony. The U.S. and French forces will then block a German drive at Chateau Thierry. Um, and July 15th, Germany launched its final push to take Paris, but the U.S. and French will hold their own and push them out. And here's a picture of Cantony. Googled it. All right, AEF dub. Um, with Germany stalled, French Marshal, I believe that's their term of general in France, French Marshal Fred Ferdinand Folk. Try and catch me there. Ferdinand Folk, Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces, ordered massive counterattacks. Mid-September, American troops drove back Germany at the Battle of San Miel. Saint Miel, something like that. Uh, September 26th, the most massive offensive for the AEF was in the region between the Moise River and the Argonne Forest. Although Germany inflicted lots of casualties, their position slowly fell to the advancing American troops. By early November, the Americans had opened up a hole on the eastern flank of the German lines, and all across the Western Front, Germans began to retreat. Hooray! Huzzah! Here's Americans celebrating. I believe that's San Miel. Um, here's a map of what we're talking about, the Argonne Forest, the borders Belgium, Luxembourg, here's Germany. 
right? And here's some battles, pictures from the Battle of the Argonne Forest. Look at dead trees. All right, 11-11, test question. Meanwhile, um, while this was going on and pushing the Germans out of France, a revolution had engulfed Austria and Hungary. And by October 1918, Poland, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia all will demand um, independence. By early November, the governments of Aust the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire had surrendered to the Allies. They gave up. And in late October, this is before that, sailors in Kiel, the main base of the German fleet, will mutiny. Within days, groups of workers and soldiers seize power in other German towns. The German emperor, Kaiser Wilhelm, will step down, and on November 9th, Germany became a republic. Two days later, the government signed an armistice. An armistice is an agreement to stop fighting. So on the 11th day of the 11th month, at the 11th hour, 1918, fighting stopped. Peace. World War I ends. Armistice signed. Kaiser is out. Revolution grows. So the big four. Although the fighting stopped, World War I wasn't over, much like this lecture. Delegates from 27 countries traveled to the peace conference at the Palace of Versailles near Paris. The treaty with Germany would be known as the Treaty of Versailles. Negotiations lasted five months. The treaty with Austria-Hungary was uh, the Treaty of Saint-Germain. So the big four, who are they? President Woodrow Wilson from the United States, David Lloyd George from Great Britain, GB, George Clemenceau from France, F, and Vittorio Orlando from Italy. Russia, however, was not invited because allied leaders refused to recognize Lenin's government as legitimate. It was not too legit. So here you have the big four. How many points? So President Woodrow Wilson, our president, presented a peace plan called the 14 points. And the 14 points based itself on the principle of justice to all peoples and nationalities. The first five points uh, tended to eliminate general causes of war through free trade, disarmament, freedom of the seas, impartial adjustment of colonial claims, and open diplomacy instead of secret agreements. The next eight were rights of self-determination, the idea that borders of countries should be based on ethnicity and national identity. Supporters of this idea believe that when borders are not based on national identity, identity nations are more likely to go to war to resolve border disputes. This principle also meant that no nation should be kept, should keep territory taken from another nation. So the central powers were required to evacuate all invaded countries and Germany had to re restore the French territory of the Alsace-Lorraine that they took from the French from the Franco-Prussian War in 1871. League of Legends? Any of you play League of Legends? Lol. Uh, no, it's called the League of Nations. The 14th point of this plan was the creation of a general association of nations called the League of Nations. Test question. The League's members would help preserve peace and prevent future wars by pledging and, to respect and protect each other's territory and political independence. Wilson was willing to give up all his other goals in order in exchange for support for the creation of the League of Nations. However, people swipe left on him. Wilson's popularity in Europe put him in a strong negotiating position. The peace conference decided to use the 14 points as a basis of negotiations, but Wilson's 14 points didn't tickle the interest of the other European powers. The plan they thought was too lenient on Germany. Premier Clemenceau of France and British Prime Minister David Lloyd George wanted to punish the Germans for the suffering they had inflicted on the rest of Europe. Remember, the fighting had been occurring for about three years before Americans had even declared uh, that they were going to fight in the war. Three years of death and destruction, okay? And then America comes in. So it's, it's almost, that seems about fair, right? Uh, that seems fair to me. Additionally, Britain refused to give up its sizable naval advantage by agreeing to Wilson's call for freedom of the seas. That just can't cut it. You know, they had the biggest empire at the time. The result, Treaty of Versailles test question re was reluctantly signed by Germany on June 28, 1919. Five years to the day, uh, assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. 
and that will weaken most of Wilson's points. Germany was stripped of its armed forces and troops were not allowed west of the Rhine. They also had to acknowledge the guilt for the start and devastation of the war. By assuming the guilt, this allowed the Allies to demand Germany pay reparations. Reparations are monetary compensation for all of the war damages it had caused. A commission decided that the compensation should reach the uh, total amount of $33 billion in 1919 money. Crazy. This sum far exceeded what Germany could pay all at once, and it was intended like that to keep Germany's economy weak, because if they have a weak economy, they can't build up their military ever again. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Here's a picture of the Treaty of Versailles. Wilson got his point across. Wilson had somewhat better success in promoting national self-determination in all these other countries. Uh, following the war, the dissolution of the four empires, the Ottoman Empire, the Russian Empire, the German Empire, and Austro-Hungarian Empire all fell apart. New nations would be created. In general, the majority of the people in each, each new country were from one ethnic group. However, Poland and Czechoslovakia were given territory where the majority of people living there were German, and Germany would be split into two in order to give Poland access to the Baltic Sea. It was nicknamed the Polish Corridor. Corridor is another name for a hallway. This would lead to a series of crises during the 1930s. Boy alert. The Treaty of Versailles, however, ignored the freedom of the seas, free, to, free trade, and Wilson's goal of a fair settlement of colonial claims. People aren't going to give up their colonies. Come on now. No colonial people in Asia or Africa received their independence. France and Britain took over colonial areas in Africa and the Middle East and received mandates from the League of Nations to rule areas in preparation for independence. France received Syria and Lebanon, and Britain received Palestine, which included Transjordan and Iraq. The treaty did, however, call for the creation of the League of Nations. That, there's that title. League members would promise to reduce armaments, submit all disputes that endangered the peace to arbitration, and to aid any member who was threatened with aggression. There's the League of Nations, Society of Nations, probably French. The gap between the bridge, here you got Uncle Sam, you got England, Italy, Belgium and France, the League of Nations. He got 1919 as a stork, bringing in the baby of League of Nations, an expected arrival. Will the stork make good as to this infant? All right, Wilson needs to sway. So President Wilson was confident that the American people would support the Treaty of Versailles. But he badly underestimated opposition in, to the League of Nations in the Senate. Remember, all treaties must be ratified by two-thirds of the Senate. And in November 1918, the Democratic Party lost control of the Senate. So that's the party that Wilson was a part of. So the opposite party, the Republican Party, uh, needed to uh, be on board for this to pass. And even though he needed Republican support to ratify the treaty, Wilson refused to take any Republican leaders with him to the peace conference. So they had no idea what he was trying to do. This ensured that Wilson's views prevailed, but it also meant that Republican concerns were not addressed. So opposition to the Senate focused strictly on the League of Nations. One group called the Irreconcilables refused to support the treaty under any circumstances. They assailed that the League of Nations as the kind of entangling alliance that George Washington and other founders warned against uh, in, their, in their documents. They believed that joining an international organization endangered American sovereignty. As a democratic republic, the American government was supposed to act on what its own citizens wanted, not what other people in other countries wanted. So the real reason why, and this is a test question, a larger group of senators was known as the reservationists, and they were led by a powerful chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Henry Cabot Lodge. There's that guy again. Reservationists were willing to support the Treaty of Versailles if the amendments were made to the League of Nations. Now, if you recall, the Constitution requires Congress declares war. Yet, the League of Nations could require member states to aid any member who was attacked. 
By doing so, the reservationists argued that this might force the U.S. into a war without congressional approval. They agreed that they would ratify the treaty if it was amended to say that any military action that the, uh, by the U.S. required the approval of Congress. Just, you know, an extra step. It, would, it seems fair, right? If it's amended, all right, because that's what our country goes by. Our country has Congress declare war. Well, if our Congress does not want to declare war, we don't want to be a part of it. So I don't know why. I mean, I get it. Wilson's stubborn. He doesn't want to uh, fold. This is his brainchild. This is his baby. He was willing to give up all other points as long as he could have his 14th point, his League of Nations. And sadly, it's his refusal to compromise that gets us where we were. Wilson refused, fearing the change would undermine the League's effectiveness, if it was effective at all. Uh, so Wilson decided to take his case directly to the American people, in the Democratic Republic we are. So September 1919, he traveled some 8,000 miles um, and made more than 30 major speeches in three weeks. Soon afterwards, however, from all the stress, suffered a stroke. While bedridden, he still refused to compromise on the treaty. So the Senate will vote on it two times. November 1919, March 1920. And both times, the Senate refused to give its consent to the treaty. So after Wilson left office in 1921, the U.S. negotiated separate treaties with each of the central powers. And the League of Nations, although it was a brainchild of our leader, our American president, took the shape without the U.S. in it. And that's funny. So, double-edged sword. The debate had pointed out the pros and cons of an international treaty and international organizations. On one hand, the U.S. joined an international organization. On the one hand, once the U.S. joined an international organization and signed an international treaty, it would be bound by those agreements, which would limit the nation's ability to act independently. Of course, there's a possibility the U.S. could always withdraw from a treaty, but when a nation does that too often, its credibility is damaged and other nations will no longer trust it to keep agreements. On the other hand, had the U.S. joined the League of Nations, it would have been able to use its power and influence to shape the League policies and enforce League actions. And it could have helped promote an international cooperation and peace. 2020 vision, hindsight, always better after the fact, right? And in the years that lay ahead, many people would argue that the League of Nations was ineffective because too many powerful nations, such as the United States, were not members. So World War I, last slide, uh, was a turning point in world history. The war destroyed the German, Russian, and Austro-Hungarian empires and badly weakened France and Britain. All across the world, Wilson's ideas of self-determination began to take hold as Europe's colonies began to work for independence. The war also triggered a communist revolution in Russia, and the rest of the 20th century would be affected by the slow motion struggle between supporters of a democratic institutions and free enterprise versus supporters of communism and revolution. And that is where we're going to stop. And I need to get a book. So, sorry, you know me. I don't have the book handy yet at all times, but your homework will be page 272, two through four. All right. I know that was a lot. That was a lot to take, um, but hopefully you guys did enjoy that. Hopefully you learned something new. Hopefully you learned a little bit more about the U.S. and their involvement and what really happened as to why the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations wasn't a fruitful outcome. All right. Hope you guys did enjoy that. If you did, make sure you hit that like button. Leave a comment. Subscribe. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.